NASA is using a laser to beam data 140 million miles across space at 25 Mbps, which is more bandwidth than a lot of us are getting on mobile phones or at home. And the image here isn't entirely inaccurate. They are shooting lasers from Earth to space or from space to the Earth. And that is literally an internet connection, which is kind of funny to me because he was like, hey, what kind of connection you got? Oh, you know, I got fiber, I got cable, and NASA's like, I got that laser connection, you know? And the idea behind it is that lasers travel basically at the speed of light and radio waves, which we currently use, do not. So we can cover large distances, like the distance between the Earth and the Moon, much faster via the speed of light than we can via radio. And this is a two-scale image of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. And yes, the dots are very, very, very tiny to point out that many like hundreds or thousands of Earths have to be crossed before you reach the Moon. It's actually extremely far away. The mission is called the Psych Mission. Love the name. They launched it in 2023. And what they want to do is explore the origin of planetary cores and study the metallic asteroid known as 16 Psych or Psyche. Uh, it's not going to reach its destination until 2029, but in the interim, it's testing this new novel uh, laser communications technology. So a lot of the stuff on the spacecraft is transmitted with its radio receiver, just sort of a standard transmission. We know this will work. However, they're also doing the laser transmission to see if that works better, and they managed to download a copy of the data in about 10 minutes at 25 Mbps from space, which is extremely, extremely impressive because right now when you're sending information from space, you're looking at like zero point something something really small uh, Mbps or Kbps. It takes days, weeks, months for some of the distant and more older spacecraft. But if this was successful, and so far it seems to be successful, at least at about half the distance between the Earth and the Moon, we're not all the way out there yet, then what we could do is build a laser link on the Moon for not instant, but relatively quick communications back and forth. The biggest issue would be file size, so text would be very fast, and a little bit of latency for the speed of light, but Honestly, this is a massive improvement. I think it's very, very cool, not without its downside. Laser-based space communications require clear skies and favorable weather conditions for successful link establishment. In contrast, slower radio communications are less dependent on weather. So like anything, it's got ups and downs, but I think this is really cool. And I just can't, I can't, but the five-year-old in me can't stop laughing thinking about having a laser connection in my house. I guess fiber optics is pretty similar, but I just love this image. Xbox console sales are tanking way faster than anybody would have anticipated, which, as the author of this article points out, is no wonder that Microsoft is exploring bringing some of its first-party games to PlayStation 5. So, as many of you may know, some of the first-party games on Xbox have moved to PlayStation, and Microsoft itself is experimenting with a new multi-platform approach, and fewer people are buying Xboxes. This was made official as Microsoft, in its third quarter, quarter earnings report, uh, said that Xbox Series X and sales revenue is down about 30% year over year. And I want to clarify here, this is Xbox hardware revenue decreased by 30% and a strong prior year comparable driven by lower volume of consoles sold. So it's not just consoles, other hardware, accessories, controllers, etc. Uh, but the primary driver behind this is less people are buying the consoles. It also means less people are buying the games and less people are signing up for Game Pass. And in February, Grand Theft Auto 4 parent company Take-Two claimed that in a presentation to investors, there were roughly 77 million Gen 9 consoles in people's homes. And it didn't take long to do the math to figure out that Microsoft had only sold 25 million consoles to date, or a little bit less than one third of the market, which is not Ooh, not a good thing. Now, the author here has pointed out that Sea of Thieves moved to the PlayStation Store. Xbox wants to make revenue on its games by opening them up and doing more PC. And Call of Duty always has the potential to be Xbox exclusive now that Activision Blizzard is owned by Microsoft. But the point is, surprisingly, sales are not great. And you would say, well, these consoles are very expensive and they've been out for a couple of years now. Perhaps the issue is that everybody who had the money or wanted one has already bought one and there's just no button, no market left to tap. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like PlayStation, Switch, or PCs are following that trend. People are still buying gaming systems. It's just the proportion of them choosing Xbox have declined, unfortunately. 
A very important legal precedence is about to be set because the FTC, as part of its antitrust investigation into Amazon, says the company's executives destroyed potential evidence by using apps like Signal. More specifically, they believe that Amazon executives chose to communicate via Signal instead of proper, more normal channels like email in order to conceal evidence from the government both during the case and before it even happened. In case you're unfamiliar with Signal, it's a messaging app on your phone, and its primary feature is that it's extremely secure. Not only is it, I believe it's encrypted, but the messages automatically delete and wipe from Signal servers after a very short period of time. It's kind of like Snapchat if it were actually private. You want to send somebody like, this message will self-destruct in two days. Signal is the app that you want to do that with. And what the FTC is claiming in their lawsuit is that Amazon executives communicating, coming up with strategy, and giving employees orders via Signal, an app where the messages get destroyed after a short period of time, is essentially tantamount to destruction of evidence, especially given that there's an antitrust going on against them. So uh, the antitrust is about Project Nessie, which kind of pushes prices around on the platform, generates extra profit, and screws over regular sellers on the Amazon website. And the government made similar arguments about Sam Bankman Free doing this as well. Uh, so things have showed up like executives in this lawsuit, uh, including screenshots of a signal chat between two Amazon executives who said, are you feeling encrypted? and then proceeded to turn on disappearing messages. The FTC is claiming that Amazon and its executives used Signal uh, in order to destroy messages and potentially conceal evidence, and Amazon didn't instruct its employees to preserve Signal messages sent in the app for more than 15 months after it was notified of the investigation. So the FTC is investigating you and part of the order, the subpoena that you have to comply with, is that you have to preserve all company messaging. Well, Amazon didn't tell its employees to stop using Signal until over a year later, so a large n amount of information has been destroyed as a result of Amazon's actions and inactions. So FTC lawyers are pursuing discovery into Amazon's efforts to preserve documents. And what's interesting about this case is it's sort of a double-edged sword. I think it's very easy to see that Amazon or a big corporation that is doing its primary instructing and communicating through a super secured like <laughs> signal app where your messages get destroyed. So the ruling here could be a little bit of a double-edged sword. Most of us would agree that Amazon executives should probably be sending official company instructions to employees through emails and other normal communication services that have a paper trail, because as a near trillion dollar company, that's an extremely important thing to have because you're beholden to both your shareholders and to regulators. On the other side of things, is using a private message app the same as destroying evidence? That would mean that anybody who communicates privately, perhaps even in a civil or criminal suit, could be accused of destroying evidence credibly just by using these apps. And similarly, is there a precedent requiring companies to use a specific type of communication? Like there's no law against just calling people into the office with no electronics going and telling them what to do. That's just the secure signal destroyed messages. Will that become illegal in the future? But on the flip side, allowing executives to communicate in secret of, you know, without oversight, especially when they're being investigated and they're d <laughs> for an antitrust suit, means that the government really could never do discovery ever again if this were common. So I don't exactly know where this one's going to go. This one's complicated, and I'm just going to hope that people that are smarter and more talented than me will be able to figure it out. There's been a huge breakthrough today in reducing plastic pollution thanks to University of California, San Diego. They have invented a biodegradable living plastic that houses bacterial spores inside the plastic that help break it down. The idea behind this is actually incredibly simple. Most of you have probably heard that there are several species of bacteria that can eat plastics and make energy from them. And we've been encouraging growth of these bacteria in order to maybe at some point in the future eat through all the plastics in a landfill. However, researchers at the University of San Diego have been able to build a soft yet durable commercial plastic used in footwear, floor mats, cushions, and memory foams, and then fill it with bacterial spores that when exposed to the nutrients present in compost will germinate and break down the material at the end of its life cycle. So the plastic you see on the left literally has the bacteria that you see in the right already inside of it. So all it needs to do is get a little bit wet, get a little bit warm, break down a little bit, expose some of these things to air, and it starts a process of breaking down the plastic and causing it to biodegrade. 
and they used bacterial spores, a dormant species of bacteria, due to their resistance to harsh environmental conditions. So they wanted one that was tough enough to survive inside of a piece of plastic. You have to get plastic kind of hot to mold it. It has to survive 135 degrees Celsius, and then you can just extrude the plastic. So then they stored it in compost, and they found that most of them re reached about 90% degeneration within five months, which is way faster than most other plastics. And as one of the researchers points out, what's remarkable is that our material breaks down even without the presence of additional microbes, which is just awesome. Now, there are some caveats here. They do need to study what actually is left behind after the plastic degrades. They haven't done that yet. And they're already continually evolving the cells to make them more durable and more tolerant to heat for more commercial applications. But there is a huge uh, scale process for this as we invest in green technologies, as we try to pollute less. Having your plastic be biodegradable through natural processes with very little additional energy inputs is an extremely valuable thing. And maybe in the future there will be less microplastics for us to deal with. I think this idea is brilliant. It's my favorite kind of science where you take two relatively well-known things and combine them in a novel way. Perhaps not the most insane, complex, and not them saying that it was easy, but this was clever, and I really like clever.